Okay, so then we have buttons over here. Mm -hmm. I don't remember camera control. Here we go. Preset. Mm -hmm. Is he seeing me? Here's. We want to see you. No, no. Yo, you. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Excellent. Yeah, I can see you. I can hear you. Perfect. Right. Uh, if you want, we can expand this window. Mm -hmm. Do you want to put the chat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Let right. me right. see if everything is okay here. Yep. We are all set. Okay. So, can we share a screen? We're on Okay, I think now. Can you can there you go. Right. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello there, Professor Blythe. Well, hello. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. It's nice to see you. I'm going to spin the camera around so that you can see uh, the class. You're okay. going to. I'm just going to give you a bit of a, a look around the room. So you've got about 45 students in the room, and I'm just going to try to set it down so that you can continue to. Oops, what happened? Did we? Oh, you're there. What happened? Oh my God! Let me see. Let me tell you. Okay. Okay, we are here. Are we good? We are good. All right. The camera that you've got into the room. I'm basically looking at the roof. It's not really doing much. Camera's not really doing much for anyone. Well, it basically drop it by about 20 degrees. Yeah, I know. There you go. That's fine. Yeah, if I stand here and hold it. <laughs> or alternatively not. I mean, you know, it's That's fine. We can just work without. <laughs> Does anybody have vertigo? It will. Okay, listen, what did we do last time? Last time Something like that. Here, so. I know, I forgot my phone. Does it work? Yes. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, you want me to get started? I would love for you to do that. I don't want to take up any of your time. I've already introduced you. Okay. All right, well, hi, everyone. Hello, I'm Mark. And um, uh, Stephanie asked me to come in and talk a little bit about sort of how this particular section of liberalism. It's an interesting course that you're doing. It's a history course, which is kind of a history of ideas, but it's a very particular set of ideas called economic ideas. Now, I've spent a large part of my career studying economic ideas, not as a correspondence theory of the world, not as a thing that tells you how the world works. It may or may not do that. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it does it really well. Sometimes it doesn't do it really well. I'm more interested in economic ideas as a thing in the world. And it's a peculiar thing because it's a particular language of power. If you think about it, if you get to define what is efficient, you're halfway to getting what you want. If you get to say that something could never work because of the precepts of economic reason, that, for example, is a bit as Isabel Weber dared to say the other week, maybe some form of price control or excessive profits tax might be a way to deal with inflation and the entire establishment goes mental on her because of it. Why is that? Because ultimately what this language of power is doing is obscuring a series of distributional choices. Who gets what in society? So rather than just being a technical language that describes how things are apportioned, it is also a language that allows you to basically accrue things to yourself or to your side or to your allies. If you take a historical perspective on this and go back to the foundation of liberalism and follow it through, you got a little taste of that in the chapter from the book that, uh, that uh, you were given to read, then you see this very clearly that what you've got here is essentially class interests dressed up, if you will, as a series of economic ideas that are supposed to be timeless truths about the way the world works, but in fact, they're highly contingent and historically specific ideas that have very, very, um, very, very uh, particular distributional consequences. So there's my intro for this whole thing. So let's get started with the fun bit. <laughs> if I can get the slides to move. Here are we. Come on, why are you not going over there? There we go, that's it. All right, there we go. So this is John Locke. 
You might as well go back to the classics. Why is John Locke important? Back in 1972, a Canadian political theorist called C.B. McPherson gave what I think is the definitive reading of Locke's second treatise of government. And if you've ever read Locke's Second Treaties, it's, you know, about uh, liberties and rights and the sovereign and sovereignty and all that. But what he says is actually, now you can ignore most of that. It's really about the fifth chapter. The fifth chapter of that book is all about property. And it asks us to consider something quite magical. If we live in a world of common property, how did we end up with private property? How did we end up with markets? How did we end up with money? Where did all that stuff come from? Now, of course, if you do that these days, the sort of standard story you get if you shake an economics textbook is some form of the kind of bartering paradox. I've got fish, you've got leather, somebody else has got corn, you need something to act as a denominator, money gets invented, blah, blah, blah. And if you read Locke, it's quite clear that no, that's not what's going on at all. What you need to do to create private property is to stop common property happening. And you do that by making claims to the rights of land. Now, why do you get to have the land? Well, because the idea that he pushes is that you have improved that land. By imbuing it with your labor, it becomes uniquely yours. So indigenous peoples and others who basically live in nomadic existence think this is the um, 1700s, the late 1600s when Locke is voicing these opinions. Colonies are beginning to open up. You've got the European conquest of North America coming at this point in time. And basically the argument is, hey, these locals, they're not really using this place. We are kind of Europeans that know what we're doing. We will turn this into farms and imbue it with our labor and therefore it's real property. So now everyone else can get lost. Uh, there's a nice trick, but ultimately in order to do that, to get property and then markets and money and all the rest of it, you're gonna actually need something else. You're gonna to need to start paying wages. You're going to have to start basically allowing people to not just take that property for themselves by imbuing it with the labor, but then making a contract that then comes out of nowhere, whereby you contract with someone to basically give up your labor and your rights to claim in exchange for wages. Well, what are the wages? The wages are paid in money. Where does the money come from? Well, that takes you back to somewhere else. It's got to come from the state. So at the end of the day, what Locke is pointing out is that to do this whole project of creating private property, clearing off common lands, creating a class of laborers and a class of property holders, creating money, creating wages, creating all the legal codes and codexes that make all that stuff possible is an act of state power. You need to have the state to do this. And this is the kind of first absence in liberal theory that is ultimately and intimately bound up with state power, but it pretends to be about individuals and individual rights. Now it is about that, but lurking in the background, those individuals get to control a state, a very particular type of state that does very little apart from enforce property rights and keep coinage stable, very much the liberal night watchman state as you'll sometimes see it called. Now, deep within this, there's a kind of anathema that goes on with liberals and a, a kind of um, a nightmare that they have, which is at the end of the day, though, every liberal onwards from Locke will tell you the problem with the state is if it gets too powerful, then it will rob you. So you've got that old sort of Second Amendment American style paradox, right? You want to have a state that's strong enough to enforce property rights and keep things stable. But you can't have a state that's too powerful because then it's powerful, more powerful than any individual landowner and it can come after them and start to take their property. So there's this kind of weird thing where you end up, as I call it in the book, you can't live with it because in a sense, the state is the anathema, the opposite of what you want in this land of this uh, world of contracts and this world of freedom and individuals and individual liberties. But you can't live without it because you need the state to make all that stuff happen in the first place. And then the real kicker, you don't want to pay for it because states are expensive. If you have to have armies, police, surveyors, courts, navies, all these things, it's going to cost a lot of money. So how are you going to do that? Well, the people with the money, the landowning classes are going to have to pay for that. But if they pay for that, that's a bit of a problem because that's taxes and they don't want to pay any. Well, is there an alternative to that? Is there some other way to round that? Well, not really, because ultimately you need the state to create the markets that you want. And that's where Locke leaves us. And if we jump forward 50 years, we get to David Hume. 
And David Hume starts to think about this problem 50 years down the line, once the Liberals really do run the state. This is the beginning of the period of the Scottish Enlightenment, long, very much liberal, but very much not uh, democratic in any, in any way. And his whole beef here is with public debt. So why is it public debt will, will destroy the nation? What's the idea here? Well, David looks at this world and he says, he doesn't talk about liberal individuals. He talks about the merchant classes because that's basically his boys. And the merchant classes, he calls them the best species of men. Because if you give them money, they'll make that money multiply because they will buy things cheap and sell them dear and that enhances the welfare of all. So it's very much a kind of like perfect, a miniature perfect competition welfare enhancement uh, argument that he makes right at the start. Now, what's the problem? We can go back to that problem that these bigger, more complex merchant societies are going to have commercial disputes. They're going to have arbitration disputes. They're going to have people ripping each other off. You're going to need courts, police. You're also going to produce quite a bit of inequality. That means that those workers, if they can't get work, might get a little bit annoyed and try and rebel against you. So that goes back to that whole thing of how do you pay for the state? Well, the problem is there's a really easy way to pay for the state, and it's called issuing IOUs called sovereign debt. So the problem is that from the point of view of the sovereign, they've got to make hard choices. They want to please the landowning classes and keep the whole capitalist machine afloat. But at the same time, they don't want a revolution from below blowing the whole thing up. In order to do that, they need to spend money on particular mechanisms and institutions to keep the thing stable. But the landlords don't want to pay in it. And, and unfortunately, the workers don't have enough money to pay for it. So how do you do it? Well, you could then borrow money from the landowners. I could issue them a debt over 10 or 20 or 30 years and promise I'll give them all their money back and an interest payment on top of that. Well, that's a great deal, basically, for the merchant classes because it's a risk-free loan with an upside. And at the end of the day, what does it do? You're not paying taxes, you get all the money back, but you get all the stuff you need to keep the world running. So the ease of debt issuance is something that concerns you. He's going to say that this is going to be too attractive to states, that there's going to be so much sovereign debt out there, it's going to crowd out private investment, that private investment is going to get diverted into state investment because it's too easy to make money that way. And if that happens, the whole sort of fire of capitalist investment begins to fall down. Now, the problem is for him and his class, it's hard not to fall for this gig because ultimately the alternative is to pay taxes and they don't want to pay taxes. So you end up in a world in which you hate the state, but you need it and you don't want to pay taxes for it, but ultimately you're going to have to do something. So you end up issuing public debt to pay for it, even though you're profiting from the debt, you don't like that because ultimately you know that that's curtailing investment elsewhere. Now, one of his good friends was, of course, Adam Smith. And Adam Smith has a great line up here, which you can see, which is the practice of funding, that is issuing debt, has gradually enfeebled every state that has adopted it. So what's his particular beef with where we are in this story? If you actually bother to read Smith, and hardly anybody ever does, but if you do, book two of book one is called The Theory of Accumulation. And it's kind of Smith's growth theory. And it's really interesting because it's very weird. When you read about it, it's basically a kind of a, a, a peon to Presbyterianism. And here's what I mean by that. All of the Scottish Enlightenment figures were basically Calvinists. They all accepted the doctrine of predestination. They were all hardcore Protestants. They thought your name was in the book or not, and it didn't matter what you've done on this earth in order to change that. But the sign of someone who was good, a la Luther, was that you would be doing good works. Now, what are good works? Well, you're not going out and spending it all on huge parties. You're not being uh, licentious or libidinous. You're living a very controlled life and you're saving every penny you can and you're putting it into useful businesses and you're growing the wealth of the community. So he took from this two sort of psychological traits which he applied to all the world. The first one being parsimony, right? Being parsimonious. We are hardwired to save and we are not spenders by our nature. The second one is prodigiality, it's opposite, which is those who are prodigious waste the community's uh, resources and they are the ones that are the danger to society. Now, if you start telling that story, who are the heroes in the story? They're the savers, they're the people who do investment. Who are the bad people in that story? They're the spenders, the ones that don't create anything. Think of the makers and the takers, right? It's exactly the same story hundreds of years ago. Uh, 
So from this, he deduces that savings itself, the very act of saving, is what leads to investment and growth. So saving good, spending bad. Given this, you're always going to have a high degree of inequality in society, and that leads to the necessity of the state. So he's the first person in the liberal tradition to really just confront the fact of the state and say, yeah, we need one, and we're going to have to pay for it. I worry about public debt as funding. It's not ideal. We need some taxes, and Smith actually has a whole chapter on taxes in the Wealth of Nations acknowledging this. But he still worries about debt, because at the end of the day, for him, the problem is all of this public debt and easy money leads to the perversion of parsimony. You're not saving and putting it into useful enterprises like Smith's famous pin factory. You're just buying government debt and living off the coupon. And that's kind of like living like a parasite rather than an investor. So even Smith, who finally comes to grips with the state, just can't basically deal with how we're going to fund this damn thing and what it means for his kind of liberal capitalist project. So in terms of austerity, the book, the, the part that you read the book from, with Locke and Hume and Smith, you kind of produce austerity by default. And what I mean by that is the following. All of them acknowledge that liberalism has a can't live with it, can't live without it, don't want to pay for it problem. That ultimately the state is both the catalyst of the market, you need a state to make markets, to make property rights, to enforce rules, to have courts, to have police, to police property, to keep down inequality, etc. But at the same time, it's the antithesis of the market, because markets are about individuals and individual contracts, with the state staying very much off the sidelines. The problem with this, in terms of austerity as a topic, happy to talk about this, this is, this is not really where we need to go with this, but I'm just using it as an example. Austerity is the policy of cutting the budget to restore the fiscal balance and thus the balance of investors' expectations whenever there's a big economic crash. By this point in history, they're not thinking in those terms. The real reason being that states don't spend enough. They're spending about 10% of gross domestic product. These days, states spend regularly between 30 and 50%. But ultimately, that desire to reign in the state, to cut the budget, is hardwired into liberalism because ultimately the budget of the state is the thing that they're afraid of. If it gets too big, it can take your property away from you. But if it's too small, it can't adequately defend your property against the masses. So you have to wait to the 19th century. And when you get to the 19th century, that's when it starts to get a little more interesting. So moving along, we get two tracks through the 19th century in terms of like liberal economics. The first one is David Ricardo, and he is really much part of the, that tradition we've been talking about. The can't live with it, don't want to pay for it side of things. And on the other side, you got John Stuart Mill, who comes along about 30 years after Ricardo. And his basic shtick is very different. His is, you know what, we're going to have to learn to live with this. In fact, we're going to have to accept the need to pay for it. So beyond Smith's grudging acceptance of taxation, Mill begins to open up a schism in liberalism that's very different from what we've seen before, where rather than just grudgingly accepting the inevitability of having to pay for the state, the state becomes central to liberalism itself. And that's a real break that happens between these two uh, fashions of liberalism, if you will. All right, so David Ricardo, the unhappy liberal, why is he unhappy? Well, he made a fortune betting on things like the outcome of the Napoleonic Wars, and he ran along with his friend Date Malthus, you probably heard the Malthus, the East India Company, so basically he was like a hands-on imperialist. He died an incredibly rich person. Why am I describing him as an unhappy liberal? Well, his basic argument about Smith, and this relates to his whole way of thinking about the state, etc., is that Adam Smith was way too optimistic about growth. <clears throat> Smith's basic idea that most of us are hardwired to save, and then very few of us spend ourselves into an early grave, creates this virtuous circle of saving to investment to the division of labor to growth, right? And he's like, nah, that's not how it works. You forget all that psychological babble. It doesn't really matter if you've got more spenders and savers or anything like this. What you have to accept is that the world is divided into classes. Now, this is why Ricardo, in many ways, is very much the muse for Marx. A lot of the, if you will, the engine that drives Marx is actually very Ricardian. So what is that Ricardian engine? Well, what he does is he says, forget about individuals for a while. Let's think about assets and let's think about the classes, the collective identities and collective action groups that form around them. So if you're capital, if you're capitalists, what do you care about? You care about profits, right? You want to make some money. 
if you're a landlord, what do you care about? You care about rents, right? You want money for basically renting out the land and either in terms of actually just giving someone the land on a lease or getting produce from it or some other payoff. And if you're labor, the majority of people, what do you get? You get wages. And here's Ricardo's insight. This is all kind of zero sum against each other. And he's writing at a time when you may have heard of the English corn laws. I don't know why they were called corn. It was actually about wheat and the importation of wheat. Britain's a small place, but in the early 19th century, it's the world's largest economy. It's also its most technologically advanced economy. Consequently, it's industrializing at a breakneck speed. People are moving off the countryside, coming into the cities. There's a great uh, um, increase in both urban wealth. If you walk around London and look at the 19th century buildings, you can still clearly see this, but also in the poverty amongst that wealth. And many social reformers and political movements are coming up, basically pointing this out at this point in time. Ricardo, being a hardcore liberal, wants none of this. He thinks this is all a distraction. He says, think about what's going on just now with corn. We've got the House of Lords, the second chamber in the British Parliament, and it's filled with landlords. And what do they do? They pass laws that means that we can't import wheat from Germany. Now, why is that a problem? Because the Germans and Prussia are really good at making wheat. And that means if we could import from them, it would be way cheaper than the wheat we make here in this very small British island. If the price of wheat fell, what would happen to the cost of reproducing labor? It would fall. So what would happen to labor's wages? It would mean that their real wages would increase, but their money wages would fall. It would mean that capitalist profits would go up because they would be paying less to feed and recreate, reproduce labor over time. And the people who would suffer would be the landlords. So what we need to do in the lower house, the House of Commons, is to have an alliance of the reformers who care about labor and the capitalists. And we will pass a series of laws that basically allows us to get our hands on that German wheat. And guess what happened? Capitalist profits went up, real wages increased, and the landlords lost power. So he didn't just talk a good game, he actually made it happen. Now, what he also did was the first theorist to think about machines. And he says, if, we're, if you look at what's going on just now, all this industrial production, we're putting people in the factories. Why do we put them in factories? In Adam's day, it was all about the pin factory, right? You know, you cut the wire and you sharpen the wire and you pass it to someone else and they put the pin on it. No, now we have massive machines that do all this sort of stuff. Now, what are machines? Well, machines are, and everyone at this time is a labor theory, a value theory. I'm happy to talk about that later if you want. But basically, the idea is that value comes from labor. So what's a machine? It's kind of like a disembodied labor. It's like a battery contains energy. A machine contains the labor that made it. And when you switch on the machine, what it's doing is it's adding value to a process. It's turning leather into a saddle or whatever it happens to be. And in a way, it's adding the labor that's kind of like embodied in that machine. Now, the thing is, you don't have to feed machines. Machines don't try and burn your house down when they get pissed off about wages. So it's in the interest of every capitalist to basically push in as many machines as possible because it increases your profits. But if everybody does that, what happens? Well, the price of the stuff that you're producing has to go down because the quantity is going to go up. So what's ultimately going to happen? Your profits are going to go down. So in the short run, growth is going to be explosive. But once everybody catches on to a technology, once everybody basically has machines going on, even in the long run, growth is going to be stagnant. Because once every market and every particular market is maxed out, you're producing basically at marginal cost or below, your next trick is to then find a market where this hasn't happened. Welcome to imperialism. And then from there, you can export it out to other countries. But at the end of the day, once you've divided the world up and you've saturated all the markets, you end up with a common rate of profits, as you called it, and a very low rate of growth. That's not a happy liberal. Now, the difference, what's important here is the kind of, if you will, the political and social consequences that follow from this. Because as far as he was concerned, this means, to quote Ricardo, that the state of the poor is wretched and likely will continue so. He saw no role for the state to intervene in that, even if it meant absolute poverty for the majority of people. This was just the natural order of things. This, of course, would be a highly contentious if not downright violent society. And of course, certain punitive actions, building of prisons, the enlisting of the police have to happen in order to keep property holders safe. But that is as far as he's gone. He's still very much in that tradition that begins with Locke, goes with Hume, goes through Smith, and then 
reaches its zenith, if you will, with Ricardo's line of thinking. Now, 30 years later, more opulence, more poverty, but also the beginnings of Chartism, the demands for democracy, et cetera. Along comes John Stuart Mill. Now, you probably heard about Mill more in terms of a book here called On Liberty, which basically is this, uh, contains two key ideas. Number one, you should never suppress ideas because even if they're repugnant by confronting them openly, you show them to be bullshit and the marketplace of ideas clears. Uh, probably not true when we think about fake news, but nonetheless an influential idea. And the second one is where do you get your governing classes from? Who are the best people to rule? And it is basically, you know, three free thinking liberal men is basically the argument. Although in fairness, the man was very much an early feminist and he was a married to a woman who was very, very politically active in suffrage, et cetera. So let's give him a little bit of credit there. But where he really began to shift was in the issue of social reform. He really began to think that democracy, although it was a threat to the landed class, to, to the liberal classes, to the property owners, was going to become an inevitability. The demands for suffrage, both for men and women, was too great to ignore. So the question becomes, how do you manage that in such a way that you just don't end up with the poor voting themselves all the rich people's money? So that was Mill's problematic, which is dealing with, as he called it, the reality of the state in its modern form. So when you confront the fact that you get great inequality growing up under capitalism and endemic poverty, which increases over time, at the same time as those who are most affected demand rights of representation and governance that we would call the vote suffrage and democracy, then liberalism has to split itself and recognize two parts of itself. This was brought into relief in a famous essay in the 70s by a philosopher called Isaiah Berlin, but it's basically in uh, uh, Mill's own work, which is that liberalism is two e images, a positive image and a negative image. And what you have with Ricardo going back through Hume, all the rest of it, is this negative liberty. That is to say that as the individual, I am free from the demands of the state. I have minimal obligations to others. I work myself through voluntary contract, etc. Therefore, the role of the state is to keep that world as it is and basically to keep people out of my business. This runs up against the fact that ultimately you just end up with a world of great social instability and poverty and eventually revolution, as the French case shown. So essentially what Mill begins to do, and others like Mill, building through the next 40 years, ultimately through people like Hobson and others, is to build a case for a more inclusive and positive form of liberalism. And what we mean by that is recognizing that you have rights to certain things, that in a rich society, poverty is completely unnecessary. And once you begin to think this way, then taxes aren't just for funding the police. Taxes can be there to control excessive fortune. Taxes can be there to actually redistribute to make sure that you don't have people in poverty. And if you don't, they're less likely to revolt. So you can have the social system you want, but at the same time, it may be even more stable rather than less stable if it's democratic and if those functions of the state are managed in the correct way. So he's the guy who opens the door to the state under liberalism as something that has spending as more than a reaction to an instability and the beginnings of social spending. And what we also begin to get at this juncture is because the whole of Britain and every other uh, European country is trying to build empires at the same time, is a link between imperialism and social peace, which goes something like this. Let's say Ricardo's right that at the end of the day you kind of produce so much that you crush your own markets and you need to find export markets to put it out there. Well, that's why India exists, right? So that's why India gets absorbed into the British Empire. It's a much bigger market. You can dump all your manufacturers there and take their raw materials back and you get the best end of the trade. But is there also a way that you can get social peace at home through the profits of imperialism? Because if you think about it, it's, an, it's almost like a new, it's another barrel to tax into. So rather than just taxing your landed upper classes or your capitalists, if imperialism produces profits and those profits can come home, why not redistribute from foreigners, from the colonized to the core working classes in the colonies? And this runs through Mill, his family, through Chamberlain, through Joseph Chamberlain, uh, in that late 19th century liberalism and reformist liberalism, that it's very much a reformist liberalism that's far um, I'm going to put it more accepting of the need for social cushioning, etc., and and, and 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 spending. But it is one that is nonetheless embedded deeply within an imperialist project that has no problem whatsoever. Basically saying it's okay, we don't need to tax our rich. We can go off and tax foreigners when we colonize them. <laughs>
Now, all of this starts to come apart in 1914, because you can have a system like this so long as all the great powers decide to play the same game in the same system, but ultimately, if they're all basically trying to find markets for export and they're all basically clashing over an empire, eventually there's going to be a war. And it was a big war in 1914. Then after the big war in 1914, the British, who were kind of the, the core of the entire global imperial and financial project, decided to go back on the gold standard in 1926. Happy to talk about this if this is relevant or interesting, but the long and the short of it was they basically tried to set their exchange rate at far too high a level and consequently lots and lots of money left the country and an already weakened British economy basically fell on its back. That and a few other policy mistakes by the Americans and others produced what we now call the Great Depression. And the Great Depression was very much a watershed moment because it really made liberalism confront for the first time the possibility that it was quite wrong about many, many things. And the two quite wrong versions of why they got it wrong are actually quite orthogonal to each other. I know that in your next class, you're basically building up to Cain, so that's what I'm going to leave you. But I want to point out at this point, there was another alternative. And the other alternative is what the historian Quinn Slobodian in his brilliant book, Globalists, um, harkens back to, which is the tradition of liberalism that comes out of Central Europe, particularly out of Geneva, particularly out of Freiburg in Germany, and it's commonly known as Austrian economics, and von Mises is one of the people most associated with this. And their explanation as to why everything went wrong was essentially the following. It's the banks, which is why people on the financial crisis happened in 2008 kind of went back to the Austrians, because they were the only ones that kept saying, it's the banks, it's the banks. And they're basically, they blame bad credit in the system and think that the best thing the government can do is step aside, let all the bad investments go to hell, and everyone take their losses and then you start again. The problem was they kind of tried that in the 1930s and it just kind of kept getting worse and ultimately ended up in a giant war which was far more destructive than World War I. The one person who had a slightly different view on this one, and he wasn't alone, there were people in Sweden thinking the same things and we're going to see actually the Keynesian moment in practice is really defined by Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, but nonetheless the idea that he has is we're not wrong in terms of we just miss what finance was doing. We were wrong and we focused on the individual. The individual is not the unit of analysis. It should actually be the economy as a whole. We need to rethink how we think about the economy works and what the economy is. And that's what you begin to get with Keynes, which is why they call his stuff macroeconomics rather than the more traditional micro. So there's three paths, as I said, through these two tracks. And the first one is liquidationism. This is a, my favorite picture of Joseph Schumpeter. It's, just, it's quite wonderful in so many ways. Uh, who was Schumpeter? Schumpeter was an incredibly interesting person. He was Austrian finance minister after World War I, and he was, in his day, a brilliant economist. He was known for the theory of modern business cycles. That is to say, why does the economy go up and down periodically? Why does it have some booms and slumps, etc.? And he was very much interested in a couple of things which hadn't really appeared till that point, but were becoming increasingly important. The first one is the critical role of the entrepreneur. That is to say, someone who comes in and disrupts, to use the language of business school today, existing markets and creates new profit opportunities, and at the same time then destroys the competition. That destruction is not to be feared, that is creative destruction. It's like taking, getting rid of gas lights and bringing in electricity. Bad for the people who did gas works, but absolutely phenomenal for everybody who was able to scale industries and entire industries on top of electricity. He, his sort of, uh, his Austrian move was to talk about how countries can end up with the long run capital structure being, or end up with the wrong type of long run capital structure. What does that mean? It essentially means the following, and you'll think this is just like kind of today, it's a very today argument, which is why these guys' arguments never really go away. Um, when you make money too cheap because you think the economy isn't working hard enough, you make money too cheap. And you make money so cheap that people borrow and then they put things into things that they shouldn't because if they were really doing a proper risk return analysis, they'd never do it. But given that the money is so cheap, they put it in. And then because other people see them putting in, they put more money in. And then everybody starts to follow the momentum of prices. And once you do that, everybody's not really investing. They're just betting on prices continuing to go up. And this is your capital structure for your economy. And rather than going into things you actually need, it's all going into speculative bubbles that eventually will blow up. 
And that's basically his take on this one. So the problem here has been that the financial authority, the central bank, that side of the government, has created the wrong incentives for finance to lend into projects that basically are the wrong types of projects. There's been an epic misallocation of capital. And as a consequence of that, what you need to do is austerity. That is to say, you had this huge binge of bad investment. Now you have to have this purge of the economy and then let everything reset. And then the entrepreneurs will come around again, pick up the remnants, and then we will continue. And that explains your business cycles, right? Now, on the one hand, I'm actually kind of attracted to a lot of what he sees in this. Um, yes, uh, excessive lending rather than excessive borrowing is often the problem when it comes to big financial booms and slumps. Yes, banks and financial markets absolutely chase at indexes and values and fashions rather than actually invest in things that we need in society. Um, stock markets, actually, coincidentally, you don't even really use them for raising capital at this point, that's mainly retained earnings everywhere. What you actually do is just use them to issue more gambling tokens. And yes, that often has very disruptive effects. But where I would differ with it is on the solution. Because if things are bad because things have blown up, blowing them up twice doesn't really do that much good. And that was the lesson of the 1930s that basically Keynes came up with. Now, standing in the way of Keynes was this guy. That's Winston Churchill. Long before he became Churchill that you know from World War II, he was the guy who ran the Treasury in the United Kingdom. And basically, the Treasury were being annoyed to death by Keynes. Keynes was already a famous economist. He hadn't quite got all his ideas together, but basically, he was working with the Liberal Party on this proposal to employ a million people to make a massive dent into public spending and doing this through the issuance of, guess what, public debt. Now, we all know how liberals feel about public debt, right? Because public debt is too easy. It's going to give you the wrong capital structure. You're going to invest in that rather than in the good stuff. So the Treasury response to this was the, called the, the argument of lazy fare and crowding out. Lazy fare was essentially, A, hands off. That is to say, government shouldn't be involved in giving people jobs because they're not real jobs. And the second one is crowding out. If you borrow all that money from the private sector in order to basically put these people to work, then the private sector no longer has that money to make proper investments. So once your government job runs out, you've actually spent all the money that you would have had in the first place. So you just let the private sector do its own thing. Now, this is wearing thin at the time, primarily because millions of people are unemployed and capitalism is really on the ropes. Communism and socialism are very much credible alternatives and in the ring at this point and punching hard. So simply saying lazy fair crowding out isn't going to do it. There's a pamphlet that Keynes does around 24 called Can Lloyd George Do It? Basically, can the liberal government bring in these types of government spending things? Can they make a, a dent into unemployment? And it gets, it's in the papers, everyone's talking about it. It's a huge thing. And this really, really pisses off the Treasury. So the Treasury get their own people together and do this reply to the whole thing called a memorandum on certain proposals. In other words, this stuff that Keynes has been talking about. And what they do is they bring in an argument that we see next in the 1980s called Ricardian equivalence in its relationship to investment, which is a very sophisticated rational choice argument that essentially says the following. If you're clever enough to know that there's a gap in the market that the government could profitably exploit, then by definition, the market would know it too, because you don't have any extra special information. If they haven't put their money in there, it probably means that you're wrong. If you do put your money in there, then people know that they probably should get their money out of there because you're crowding them out. So ultimately, any attempt by the government to do direct investment is going to have a deleterious effect on investment. It's far too clever for its own self, but nonetheless, it's the type of thing that economists tend to like. Oh, and by the way, at the end of the day, we just don't have enough public works because obviously Britain has all of the railroads and roads and everything else that it needs, which obviously was nonsense, but nonetheless, it was a convenient argument to make at the time. So that's, got, that's where Britain gets left, but it doesn't really matter because the Keynesian moment, as I was gonna say, you're gonna talk about Keynes next time, isn't confined to Keynes. Where you actually really begin to see this is in Germany and Imperial Japan. So it's the fascists that get on, on, on board with this. And what's the basic idea that they all stumble upon? It kind of goes with the political philosophy. If you think about it, what is it that fascism basically has? It has a very organic conception of the nation, usually one that's built upon race and racial purity. But it's super individual. That's the important point. 
It's not about you as an individual and your rights and your duties and your contracts, your responsibilities. It's about your relationship to the state and your membership of a community. It's very macro in its thinking. And what people like Koryeko in Japan and some of the economists around um, uh, Helferding and others in Germany in the 1930s began to think about was, is it possible that the individual focus creates errors? And this is a problem called the fallacy of composition, something's called a scalability problem. And a really easy way to think about this is if anybody's a sports fan, whether your sport is American football or soccer or basketball, whatever, there's a, an error that people make all the time in, in journalism and sports where they talk about what this team needs is this one player. And there's this argument, if you get this one player, you put them in and it will change the team and it'll make them perfect. And it never works. Why? Because if you get somebody who is so different from the other members of the team, they're going to change the way that they play in order to accommodate that player. That's not necessarily a net improvement on where you were before. In other words, the whole, the team, is different from the sum of the parts. And how the parts interact is really, really important for the performance of the whole rather than the individual parts. <coughs> Why is this a... <coughs> Pardon me. Why is this important? It's important because it really flies in the face of liberalism and, and Schumpeter. It's not about entrepreneurs bringing things to market and being successful or any of that sort of stuff. It's not about granny bringing her savings to the bank and lending it out to the entrepreneur. We need to change how we think about how the economy in the macro performs. So what does that do for investment? Well, rather than it being about savings automatically leading to, uh, to investment, you only invest when things are going well. Investment is ultimately a social expectation. <coughs> so if there's been a recession going on for a year, you're probably not going to invest. If it goes on for two years, you're definitely not going to invest. And if everybody thinks that way, you can guarantee the third year there'll be a recession because everyone's looking to each other for clues about what to do. So the very actions that you're doing now as individuals in the present create the very future that you're trying to avoid in the first place. Given this, investment takes on the character of, a, of what you would call a multi-person prisoner's dilemma. You're the one that doesn't want to be caught making the bad investment when everyone else is sitting on the sideline protecting their capital. So it's rational for you to sit on the sideline protecting your capital with a result that investment collapses. If this is the case, then the whole assumption of classical liberalism that savings automatically leads to investment has to be chucked over. What it means is that they're temporarily separate things. My decision to save and my decision to invest can happen at radically different points in time. And that decision to separate the two is why you get recessions. If that's the case, what matters is consumption, how it leads to I-star, which is investment expectations. What matters is the general level of all consumption in the economy, not yours, not your saving rate, not how much grandma's getting at the bank, but how much consumption there is. Because if there's a lot of consumption, that will change my expectations of the future, and that will make me invest. So the important relationship is between macro consumption and investment expectations rather than savings and investment. Now, that's also coming into a world because it's ironic that it's fascist governments that first embrace these logics. We think about this with Hitler's building the, the autobahn. We think about the Japanese massive reindustrialization projects after 35 and the export of capital to Korea, et cetera, et cetera. Why does this, you know, the irony for liberals, it's, it's the irony for liberals and liberal democracy is by the time that they wake up to the threat of fascism, they begin to realize how powerful their economies have become by embracing this way of thinking. And what it does is it changes the problem from can't live with it, can't live without it, don't want to pay for it, to can't live without it and now must pay for it to avoid catastrophe. Because these fascist regimes are going to start wars and we are completely ill-equipped to actually fight them and deal with them. By the time that you get to the realization of this, by 1942, Schumpeter writes a, a book, which is a kind of a lament for, the, for everything that has failed that he holds dear in liberalism. And it's a wonderful read. It's a, it just, it's a very poignant book in many ways called Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. And in this book, he talks about creative destruction, not as a, a, a micro motor in any economy that generates entrepreneurs and profits, et cetera, but as the way that capitalism evolves over many centuries. In other words, 
he's not admitting he was wrong. He's just simply saying, oh, it's, it's too early to tell. Uh, he calls Lord Keynes, Keynes is a lord, his ideas are laughable, but it, at the same time, those are exactly the ideas that are powering World War II, bringing America and American war power into the war. I'll give you one example as to how uh, powerful these macro ideas are. There's a wonderful historian called Adam Tooze who wrote a book about interwar, about German fascism's economics called The Wages of Destruction. And he, was, he told me one day about how he went into the archives and he found this note and this note had been using the kind of Keynesian logics of GDP calculations, which were just beginning to emerge then, in Britain with a guy called Colin Clark. And somehow the Germans had gotten their hands on something that Clark had written from the Treasury, and they backfitted the model and figured out what he was doing. So what they did was they started to compute GDP computations for all the different combatants in the war. So they baselined Germany at 100, and then they put Britain at like 82, and they put Russia at 70 or whatever, and then they did America, and America came out at like 300. And it's just that moment where they just went, oh, oh my God, we're screwed. And that's the power of an economic idea. It can reframe your reality and make you see something in an entirely different way. So far from being laughable, these ideas were reshaping the world. Shim Peter's retreat was to basically say that all of this is socialism, and all of socialism eventually becomes a bureaucracy. And a bureaucracy is just when the government runs and plans everything, there's no entrepreneurship. And at that point in time, liberalism dies. Why? Because it's the end of the entrepreneur. It's the end of, as he calls it, bourgeois virtue. And he even sees it as the end of the bourgeois family. So by 1942, the leading light of intellectual and academic liberalism is actually declaring that it's over. It's game over for liberalism. And what you're going to get is some kind of Lord Keynes meets socialism as your future. And it didn't quite work out that way, but I guess we can leave it there and have a chat about whatever you find of interest. So I will stop sharing the screen. And there we go. How's that? Terrific. Thank you so much. Can I start by asking you a question that we're beginning, uh, that we're asking each of our presenters? First question. Go on. Are you a capitalist? Everyone's a capitalist. Explain. We are all petit rentier, as our friend Thomas Piketty puts it. Um, I bought an apartment in Boston a few years ago. The bank owns most of it, it's called a mortgage. But nonetheless, I own half of it because I paid off half the mortgage. I then rent that out to someone else because you never sell Boston real estate once you've got it. So basically, I'm a rentier, which is a form of capitalism. Okay. And guess what? Everybody's a rentier in some point, some way, shape or form. You don't really know it, but you're doing it when you're selling your data involuntarily right through the iPhone. They've got an average revenue per user that they're getting from farming and using your data whenever you go to Facebook. You are part of those market contracts. You are selling your data, whether you do it or not, because when you click that, I accept, that's what you've just accepted. So one way or another, we're all tied up in what Carlisle once called the cash nexus. Okay. We just did a podcast for Market Watch on the very issue that you just raised on owning your data. Uh, it is something that most of us don't think about. So what about the rest of you? What would you like to ask? Um, I actually kind of wrote about this in my question because I guess I was a bit confused by the Adam Smith quote, the practice of funding has gradually enabled every state that has adopted it because isn't funding essentially being able to afford capital, which is obviously an integral part of capitalism. So why would Smith say funding weakens every state? Wouldn't that imply capitalism weakens every state as well? So it's interesting. Smith never really used the word capitalism. That word doesn't come up until the 19th century. So he tends to talk about merchant society, which is where you get some David Hume. When they're talking about funding, they mean one thing, states issuing debt. Right? That's really what they mean by funding. And for them, it's, the, it's this wonderful Faustian bargain, right? I'm a rich capitalist. I don't want to pay any taxes. In fact, 10% of the population generate and own 80% of the wealth in these societies, right? 
20 to 20 80 splits a pretty good splits you see it all the time so i could pay for the state but i don't really want to do that so i'm going to allow the state to borrow my money they'll give me it all back while they've got it they'll use it to build all the shit they need to keep me safe the army the prisons all the rest of it and they'll still pay me interest in the meantime well you know that's brilliant except to like why would i do something hard like set up a business i could just become a bond trader because if the state fails we're all dead anyway so essentially that's given me basically a free option with an upside what a great deal well, that's when Smith and Hume and these people start to go, oh, no. But if we all take that deal, what happens to capitalism? We don't call it that, Merchant Society, right? You know, what's going to happen to this great world we've built? And there's going to be, Shun Peter will come along and say there'll be no entrepreneurs. They'll all be trading government debt. So that's what he means by funding. That's the enfeeblement. It stops you basically doing all the kind of uh, entrepreneurial stuff, taking risks. Why would you take risks when you can get 5% for just sitting at home and you get all the money back 10 years later? Go ahead. Did you hear the question? Uh, Mike's not picking up. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Why do you think that different governments adopt or adhere to different ideologies? What, over time? At different times? So a good way to think about it in terms of what I've just given you is let's think about the shift from Smith to Ricardo. So Smith is writing at the very beginnings of what we would call modern capitalism. He's living in Glasgow in Scotland. Glasgow is a very rich place at that point because Glasgow is part of the triangle trade. So essentially what they're doing is they're building ships. The ships are going down to West Africa. They're picking up slaves. They're taking them to the West Indies and they're bringing back sugar and molasses, stopping off in uh, Virginia, bringing back tobacco, swapping out some more slaves and then coming back with all that loot to Glasgow, right? So that's how they're making their money. So when he's talking about society, who exactly is he thinking of when he's talking about this? He's talking about people like him. I'll give you a little example of this. Um, if you ever go to Glasgow, there's uh, an area called the Toll Gate. And the Toll Gate was literally tolls, like, you know, uh, you paid fees to go in and out of the city. It was like the city walls. And next to this was the Merchants Club, people like him. And they had the only sidewalk in the city. And if you were a a normal person and you wanted to get out of the mud and the dirt and walk on the sidewalk you would find that there were people employed by the merchants club who had clubs who would smack you on the head until you got off the sidewalk because that sidewalk wasn't for you now when you make your money through the exportation of people the importation of sugar and the denial of basic rights to your fellow man you will invent all sorts of bullshit to justify what you're doing and that's what we do all the time, right? One of the most interesting things about the, 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 the if you will, the conjoined history of slavery and capitalism is that ca slavery as a practice is so awful, you need to invent racism to justify it. Only by seeing people as inherently inferior can you treat them so badly. But you only do that because the profits were so goddamn high, right? So that's the sort of things that drive it. Now, now go to, go to, to uh, the world of Ricardo. You've already had the abolitionist move. You've paid off the slaveholders. Britain is now, we don't do that anymore. We made a fortune, but now we're okay, right? So we don't do slaves anymore. But what do we do instead? We do industrialism. So what have you got? You've got the landowners facing off against the capitalists and the workers. So again, what type of society is that going to get, what type of society is that going to be? It's going to be one with a lot of class conflict. What types of ideas and ideologies are going to be produced by that society, both to justify that order and to challenge that order? Well, the justification is Ricardo, the critique is Marx. So every period of history produces these oppositional tensions. And everybody creates webs of belief and significance, which allows them to basically act in this world as meaningful agents, because a lot of the things that we do are horrible. And without those legitimate frameworks, we literally wouldn't be able to do it. Good 
an example of this just now. I spoke to someone a little while ago who is the very top, so the second from the top of a very large global mining corporation. And I said to him, how's the whole green transition working out for you? And he said, we take that much more seriously than you think. And I said, well, why would you take that? Why would I take you taking that seriously? Why would I take that? And he said something very interesting. He says, because even people like me have children and no one wants their own children to think they're a bastard. <laughs> Isn't that good? All right. So basically, there's somebody who's at the apex of predator capitalism that still needs a justificatory ideology for knowing what he's doing, but is not impervious to the critique that your own kids will eventually hate you unless you do something about this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> eventually what happens in, in uh, at home is if the greater profit falls and you can no longer make a profit in markets, imperialism is sort of inevitable because you need to find some way to fund the economy, right? But we're, and you also talk about how debt doesn't enable states in the same way that the Smith Hume sort of said. But if you look at, I think, sort of modern third world countries that have been victims of imperialism in the past, imperialism in the past, right? They don't have the same ability to like um, to borrow from the same people that America or much of Western Europe has, right? Um, if you're a country like Egypt, and you need creditors, you're going to go to the IMF, right? We're going to enforce the austerity that um, essentially causes the problems that require you to lend. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how do you borrow? Right? So, is there, like, how do you sort of, if you're, say, a third world, uh, like, the, a, like a finance of a third world country, how do you sort of reconcile um, right. that economy with the economy? So, th there's two things. That I, I think I got most of your question. If this doesn't 100% go, like, ask me again, right? So I think there's just, I'll just say there's two things that are in play and they're both very important and they're both really hard problems for the world, right? So the first one is what economists call original sin. And original sin is borrowing in somebody else's currency. Now, why is it that you have to borrow in somebody else's currency? Because you need to basically export more than you import because you don't make everything that you need yourself, right? So but unless you're a very large economy, that's true for most economies. So over the long run, you have what economists call a current account constraint. Now, if you are, let's say, uh, Sweden, right? You make high value added goods and services. You give the world ABBA, right? You know, you don't go to war with anyone, even though you're a huge arms exporter. You can have your own currency. You peg it really to the euro because that's where most of your trade goes. And it's considered a hard currency, right? That is to say, I think the value of this is going to maintain over time. But if you're Argentina and basically you borrowed a shit ton of dollars that you couldn't pay back and then you paid back another bunch of dollars and you borrowed more dollars to pay back the dollars that you couldn't pay, etc. Then eventually people will start saying, hey, if you want anything from me, I want it in dollars. I don't want your currency. Now that creates a big constraint for you at that point in time, because the only thing you can then do is basically squeeze your economy harder and harder, the old austerity binge and purge, in order to basically write your terms of trade so you can export more, so you can get more dollars and boost your exchange rate, which over the long run never really works, right? So you've just to have, I mean, that's just a structural problem. If you're regarded as a hard currency, you get away with it. If you're not, then you've got to basically import a hard currency, and that's a problem if you're already heavily in debt. So point number one. Point number two, the natural state of global capitalism is deflation. Now, I know it's a big claim, but I'll justify it. If you, if, uh, I used to drive Volkswagens. Volkswagen Golfs are pretty cute little cars, they're good. You can get in one from the 1970s, and you can see that it's still the same car. But then you look at one from the 80s and you notice the quality improvements that have gone on. Then you look all the way up to now and you look, you get into the latest one and you get and sit there, right? And this is transformed in terms of what it is technologically, et cetera. But when you think about the fact that over the past 40 years, there are so many more car manufacturers from so many more countries and they can all build amazing cars at this point. Then if you look at the actual price of the car in real terms, the, part, the car's fallen by a third in terms of uh, in, in its real terms. But the quality improvements have been 200%. So when you have global competition in markets, you push down prices. Now, the problem with that is ultimately, unless you're capturing export share all the time, you're pushing down wages. 
And if you are capturing export share, what you're doing is you're basically causing unemployment in the country that otherwise would have been making their own cars. So add, all those, add those two things together, right? The small open economy current account constraint with original sin, and the fact that everybody wants to export rather than import, and you end up with an inherently unstable system. That's basically it in a nutshell why we have a lot of the problems that we do. And it's not clear how you solve either of those two things. So to take the example of like, if, uh, currently in the global economy, China plus East to Asia plus Europe is about 70% of the global economy. That exports pretty much to the 30% that is the United States and the other Anglo countries. They run deficits that are 96% of their surpluses. One depends upon the other. And it's not clear who actually gets the best end of the deal on that one either. Did that help? I think so. I, yeah, I, you basically, he was asking if you were the finance minister in Egypt. Oh, I thought I said part of Egypt in general. How, how do you get out of, but you, you spoke to. Well, with Egypt, it's actually dead simple. You, you, you never get out of it because your loans are always forgiven and rolled over and they give you new dollars because you're too strategically important to the United States. So, you know, everyone talks about Argentina going bankrupt eight times over 200 years. Uh, Egypt has actually gone bankrupt, but they never admit it because the IMF don't call it a bankruptcy 10 times since 1950. So, you know, when it comes to serial defaulters, Egypt, there you go. But the minute you sign the uh, the 1977 agreements, then the IMF is just going to roll you over every single time. So if you know that, why would you ever bother reforming? Yes. So, for example, I know we're going to have the Greek financial minister come in. Do you think Greece's only option was to have a bigger organization that did have a stable currency like the EU have to bail them out, or could they have done it on their own? Or do you need uh, the sixty-four thousand dollar question? I'm actually going to go out and see Yanis in the middle of April. I haven't seen him for years, so but I doubtless we'll be talking about this. It's a really tricky one. I'll tell you why it's a really tricky one. Um, I was very much on the on the Greek side on this one, uh, and up to including leaving, but it's not clear that the leaving is costless, and here's why. When you've got all, everything in your country and all your contracts and all your assets denominated in this thing called the euro, if you are a Greek citizen that has any brains in your head, you're going to open a German bank account or a Bulgarian bank account or anyone that accepts euros. And you're going to start banking all your stuff through there. You're going to register your house there. You're going to do that. Why? Because you know that if Yanis actually gets to do what he wants to do, he'll pull you out of the euro or he'll bring in the drachma. And the new drachma will take a massive devaluation against the euro. So let's say that you've got a million euro house. Do you want it to be a million euro house or do you want it to be a 7 million drachma house, which is really a 700,000 700, euro house because of the depreciation? So the very fact that everybody knows that creates a capital flight problem that the minute you try it, your exchange rate will crash before you even leave. Now, how do you get around that? You do capital controls. Okay, that's really hard. It was really hard in the 19th century and 20th century. It's really, really hard in the 21st century because I can do it through Ethereum. I can do it through crypto. I can do it quite legitimately by just opening up a bank account in, in Germany and then hosting my assets in the Isle of Man, right? So if, you're, if what you're trying to do is to basically not destroy national savings on the way out the door, it's really hard. Now, Given that the alternative is perpetual debt and paying back a large whack of GDP for the next 40 years, there is a course of action, there is a claim to be made that, yeah, that sucks, but ultimately what you do is you get such a bang on your exchange rate being cheap that you make up the difference on exports and you grow your way out of it. That is entirely possible. It's also a very big bet. Right? When Brexit happened, the pound went down, exports didn't pick up at all. So it's not clear that these are kind of like, you know, universal laws that we can rely upon. Either way, it was a highly risky strategy and it was contingent upon keeping capital in the country, which is harder and harder to do. So does that mean that I, I prefer that they stayed in the, no, I wish it had been another way. I wish it had been the third way that they could have gotten out. 
Did I see a hand? Did I see a hand? Are we done? Yep, go ahead. Uh, at all, if there was no age of discovery and imperialism. Can you repeat the question? What Stephanie? do you think? What do you think capitalism would have looked like if it would have survived at all without the age of discovery and imperialism? Yeah, it, it wouldn't. Well, oh, it's a really great question. I mean, what a counterfactual. I mean, could it? Could you have even had it? I mean, have you, has anybody ever seen the John Oliver episode he did way back when he started doing the John Oliver stuff? And he called the British Museum an, an active crime scene. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that, that's, it, it's so funny because it's so true, right? I mean, there is literally nothing British in the British Museum, right? We just stole everything. Now, you know, is that part and parcel of accumulation? If you read Piketty's work on this, it's really interesting. In the 19th century, overseas income was equivalent to two years of national product, right? When you add up national wealth. So when you get rid of that, when the colonies drop off in the 1940s and 50s and it goes to zero, then basically you do get a big shock to like overall stocks of wealth in these countries, but not critical, right? The numbers don't show, I mean, India was fantastically profitable for Britain, but it was also fantastically expensive to run, particularly towards the end. So could you have had a form of capitalism that was non-imperial? Yeah, not every country that adopted capitalism had an empire. All of the countries that did imperialism ended up causing themselves huge amounts of trouble by doing so. So net on net, it was definitely a loser. But it was, you know, the only history we have. Like, we, we don't get to try it again and run it again and see how it would go the other way. I mean, some of the more really interesting stuff here is the relationship between Japan and its colonies. So whereas, you know, for, particularly the French were very much exploitative and extractive in their colonies, the Japanese were ruthless, brutal, and tyrannical, but they were net capital exporters to the periphery. And that actually had a big effect on South Korea's ability to grow and modernize in the 1950s and in the 1960s. So imperialism itself, you know, it, it's, it's an awful project, but we can't actually legitimately theorize away its effects. It is an absolutely integral part of everything that's gone on. Hence, the British Museum is an active crime scene. One last opportunity. Yes. Remember, I am the only professor you will ever meet who has the same voice as Shrek. <laughs> Say the question again, Stephanie. Uh, what's the, what do you feel about Turkey going on with the high inflation and Erdogan going crazy with interest rates? Erdogan, inflation, interest rates, Turkey. Go. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'll, I'll, I'll sign up to the, to the great claim that basically interest rates are, I really like to claim that interest rates are universal basic income for the already rich. Uh, I like that. I think I, there's a certain degree of truth in this. Um, Unfortunately, Turkey's economic problems run much deeper than interest rate policy. And you can't cheapen capital and exports enough to grow your way out with low rates when your own creditor class would rather hold any other asset than your own currency, right? If you have got, if you got them completely captive and they can only hold the currency that you issue, you can run a low interest rate policy and you can potentially grow your way, grow your way out so long as you don't have an import constraint, which they do. Uh, in a world in which they can swap into dollars, euros or crypto, if you're not going to pay them to compensate for the risk of devaluation, they're just going to hold other currencies. That's what's going on. So it's not the simple story about push them one way, push them another way. That assumes a kind of closed economy dynamic that Turkey simply doesn't exist in. And you've had 30, 20 to 30 years of policy whereby you had a huge amount of capital in, imports that came in in the 2000s, particularly in the age of quantitative easing. When we pushed down rates in the core, yield, everybody became what the finance they call a yield tourist. You went out everywhere in the periphery looking for anything that's got a positive rate of return. 
So the road that runs from Istanbul right along out to, um, I forget the big city that's uh, out the end, Eastern Anatolia. Apparently there are hotels that have been built there, hundreds of them that no one will ever sleep in because that was just what you did because the financing was so cheap. So I don't want to go back to the Austrians, but you know, when you've got super cheap money, you can build a lot of shit that you don't need. And that can be a huge drag on the economy, irrespective of your interest rates. How do you think, wh how, where do you think things go now that we're on this Turkey subject, which is a little removed from where, where the class is, but it's okay. Where, how do you Sorry. think it ends? How do you think it ends in Turkey? I mean, well, where he, he can try and put up capital controls. And if he does, he risks hemorrhaging even more capital. Or you can get to the play whereby he's hoping to get to, which is a kind of deep import and substitution um, um, play with super cheap exports and super cheap labor. The problem with that is you're still an import dependent economy. So your on the street levels of inflation are going to be really, really high. Uh, if, you've got, if you have very, very sophisticated governance instruments and good control of all your supply chains, in theory, like China, you might be able to obviate that and control that. It's not clear to me that the Turkish state has the Chinese yeah. state's capacity for that sort of stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. The pleasure was mine. I'll be in touch. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.